Well, hey there, folks. We are live. For those of you that are catching the live stream anyway, those of you on the audio, if you want to catch the a little bit of this, actually, it's going to have some uh, some uh, video component to it with uh, with some imagery. And if you want to check it out, even if you're listening to the audio, you can go by the website, pull up this episode, and you'll see a link or an embed of this video that we're doing because I'm going to be trying out a new feature today with the video live stream of the podcast, and that is using StreamYard, they recently added basically presentation slides capability. So I wasn't sure how well that would work, but when I was putting together today's episode on 30 garden hacks, um, I realized, you know, I could go out and take a picture of a few of these things, not do anything fancy with slideshow presentation, or just throw some pictures on it and try this out. So part of what I've been doing using StreamYard to live stream at least portions of the podcast, if not the entire podcast, is that I'm learning StreamYard as we go as well. So I'm kind of function stacking, which is a big thing with uh, permaculture, homesteading, landscape design, all of this stuff, in that you get more than one thing out of it. So I'm learning a new skill set. Um, and my other thing is now I'm getting almost some content from every podcast into video form without doing any editing. And then that lives forever in you know on YouTube and on Odyssey and other places. So that's cool. And it's also, I think, going to let me eventually put together some pretty cool uh, educational uh, programs. I, I have a variety of things I'm thinking of. I need to settle on one and do that um, because this really makes taking education to a higher level a real possibility. I, I'm, I become incredibly um, impressed with StreamYard and using it for uh, this purpose. And it's not a commercial for StreamYard. I'm not an affiliate. If they had an affiliate program, I would sign up though. I'll admit it. Uh, they don't pay me or anything. It just has been probably the best thing that I've done to advance the show from a technical standpoint in at least five years. So I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. So we'll be playing with that a little bit today. And what we're going to be talking about again is 30, that's right, 30 hacks to make your garden season in 2022 awesome. Now, I, I don't think that we're going to end up in a situation here where anybody listening to this is going to be like, I'm going to do every damn one of those because generally we take and we pick and choose what works for us. And on that note, it is not just going to be my 30 hacks. There's actually 16 bonus hacks that came in from members of the community on Me, We, and Float. And I will try to give credit to those who said it. If you said it and I give somebody else credit, I put this all together in like two hours, guys. So sometimes people get left out or maybe you said something and I had already had it in my list. So I didn't create duplication of it. And I tried to give joint credit in a few situations. I'm sure I'll leave some people out. I'm sure I'll leave suggestions out. But hey, 30 plus 16, that's 46 freaking hacks. And on that note, we're going to be doing this lightning round style today. And I think it's the first seven that I have images for. So we're going to switch over to that now if you're on the uh, video anyway. And my first hack, you're sitting here looking at a plant basket. Basically, these are baskets that you use to grow aquatic plants in ponds with. So you put some soil or some rock media, something in there. You put your plant in there, and then you sit that in the water, either just in the water emergent or you know below the water and let the plant grow above grade. And I've been using these a long time for that purpose. But you know what they're great for? When you're hardening off little seedlings and you're going to put them out and that that you know that summer or early spring, you know, mid-spring sun is just going to beat down on those seedlings and it's just going to murder them. I've done the, the calculations and it's roughly a 50% shade. It's a perfect thing to harden off your plants with. You set your little plant out, you take your basket, you sit it over top of it, you leave it there for you know the whole day for a day or two maybe on the third day you go out and you take it off when there's a couple hours of full sun left on your garden for the day maybe the next day you give it four hours and then the, the fifth day you just take it and stack it back on the shelf these things i I've, I've linked to them before on amazon i haven't done that today the reason is i don't recommend you buy them on amazon i generally find them at like home depot and lowe's for like less than two bucks a piece and they're more than that on Amazon, and they're more than that on every online place that I found them. So these are ones I recommend that you source locally. But this, and we're going to go kind of lightning round with this. So we're going to go fast because uh, we got so much to cover. But but this is definitely um, one of the, the the best options that that there is out there for doing this. And it just looks to me like I have to make a quick update here. 
so that I don't screw myself over. And uh, so just bear with me a second. Those of you on the audio, I shall endeavor to take this out for you. All right, there we go. I had some stuff out of order. I moved everything around a little bit to coincide with the slideshow. All right, so next up, store your tools right in the garden. And for those that are looking at the, the presentation, I have a little garden trowel hanging up right on the, the, the back trellis of one of my garden beds. Just a couple of screws put there and that shovel set right there. Why? Because my garden trowel is the number one tool that I use in the garden. That and my little serrated uh, grape knife that we won't get into today. Uh, well, we kind of will a bit. The reason the shovel is just sitting out there like that, that is a solid cast aluminum shovel. Um, it is the best garden trowel on the planet. I got tired of having trowels wear out, break down, become loose, have the handles fall off, them rust, etc. And I found this one. It's uh, It was recommended by Elliot Coleman, who's one of the premier authors in the gardening space. And um, when I found it, I was like, yeah, it's twice as much or three times as much than an equivalent trowel, but it will last for the rest of my life. Even if my dog eats the handle, he's only going to eat the rubber insulation off and it's still going to be functional. Since it won't rust or break down or degrade in any way, I just have it hanging there. My plan this year, one of many things that I have planned to, uh, to increase my efficiency, I'm going to build myself a little cabinet just for the small hand tools like this, the most common ones that get used. Again, my, like my uh, serrated knife, uh, a pair of pruners, and a couple other things that get used in the garden all the time. I'm going to attach that to the back of my raised beds that are pretty high. You guys would have to figure out maybe a tree next to your garden or something like that. And that way, when you're out in the garden and you see something that needs doing, you just do it. You don't have to be like, you know, I'm not really sure about this. I'm I, I, I'm not really, you know, or you don't have to be like, I got to go get it. And then you don't get it done. Right. Or you get distracted or you leave it out there by having it right there and being able to put it away or get to it quickly. You get it done right away. Next one I have for you is composting with wire fence rings. What I'm talking about is like your chicken fence, your horse fence, your goat fence, the stuff that comes in a big roll. Most of us use it one way or another on our homestead. If you don't use it because you're on like a suburban area, you probably have a friend somewhere out in the rural community has some extra stuff with this lying around. You take a piece of it, you make it into a loop, you, you, you wire it to itself. The one in the picture there is actually about three foot tall. It's from a six foot high roll of fence. I cut it in half to make two out of one. And all you do with these is you just throw all your green matter and brown matter in them. That's it. And is it the best way to compost in the world? No, but it's easy, so you'll do it. And what I end up doing is whenever I have green material, I throw it in there, I throw a little bit of brown on top of it, and I just keep going until it's full. When it's full, it's full. I leave it sit, usually end up with about 75% of the volume left after it fully, you know, kind of composts down. And I'll tell you what's really cool. You can easily just throw a tarp over it once it's full, wet it down. When it's half full, you can start tarping it. But when you get to the point where, hey, I'm ready to use this compost, all you do is grab the loop and just pull it off. And then there's a pile of compost there to shovel. Really, really simple, really, really easy, great way to go. Next up, what I call the 15-minute timer wicking bed. I've talked about these sometimes this year. Uh, what you're looking at, if you're seeing the image here, is a 21-gallon uh, concrete mixing tray that I've made a wicking bed out of. And I have a layer of rock on the bottom like any kind of a wicking bed would have. Then I have a layer of landscape fabric to keep the soil out of the rock. Then I have a soil layer up above that. And then I have my plants planted into it. On the back side of it, you have water that is pumped in out of the little pond that's right in front of it. This could be a reservoir on the ground. This could be a pond. This could be anything. This could be a timer on your freaking garden hose as long as you have some place to send the overflow, okay? The timer kicks on once a day for 15 minutes. It pumps water into the wicking bed till it reaches the overflow height of the wicking bed. It overflows for that 15 minutes. The timer kicks off, doesn't come back again uh, until the next day. That means that my wicking beds are always topped off. The plants never need watering. I don't have to worry about water spraying on top of the plants, getting any kind of fungal diseases. It is a perfect plant environment, 24-7, 365, with absolutely no work whatsoever. Next up, um, we're going to talk about um, regrowing produce here. I think I had a slide out of order, but this is the first time, so that can happen. What I have there is a carrot. 
And a lot of people don't know that the, the green part of a carrot is edible. And you know what it tastes like? It tastes like really great parsley because carrot, carrot and parsley and parsnip and a few other things are all in the parsley family. So it tastes like awesome parsley. Now, what I do when I have to buy carrots, and I don't grow a lot of carrot, but if you grew your own carrot, you could just save the tops. But when I have to buy carrots, I buy organic and I buy carrots that still have the green tops on them. After I use the carrot, I take and cut off about 50% of the green on the top of the carrot. And I take the top of the carrot and I stick that into one of my ebb and flow beds in my aquaponics or hydroponic system. This is a little aquaponics indoor system right here. And it starts growing. It grows really well. You cut the tops off and use it. But it's not the only thing you can do that with. I do this with celery. With celery, I simply, when I buy a bunch of celery, I pull the outer stalks off. I don't cut the bottom off. I leave the bottom intact. And I leave the last two or three uh, stalks that are the heart of the celery, put that in one of these beds and it grows. You don't do aquaponics, hydroponics, whatever. Doesn't matter. As long as you're not putting it out in a freezing weather, so doing the right time of year, you can plant these things in soil and they'll grow. You know what else does this? Bok choy. You can grow your own bok choy or you can buy it. When you harvest it, usually cut it just below the soil level, right? You pull your outer stems off it, take the core, just like the celery plant it, it'll grow back. When you grow bok choy long enough, it's a biannual like broccoli. It's actually in the same family as broccoli. It'll eventually put little flowers on it. Now, a lot of plants, once they go to flower, they become kind of uh, bitter and they go to seed and they're not very good. Not bok choy or bok choy, either one of them. You can just go ahead and use them like little broccoli florets when they start to do that. Uh, green onions. When I buy green onions, I just, I never even put them in the refrigerator. They go straight into my system and I cut the tops as I need them. It's like a never ending onion. Uh, watercress. I buy living water, watercress in the grocery store when, we, when we're out. Uh, maybe we lose it to the winter or something. Throw a couple of plugs of it into the system. It starts growing. There are so many things that we can grow. Baby beets. Every once in a while I'm in a store, stuff will be on sale and I'll see uh, baby beets and uh, they'll be on sale. Organic baby beets, little golden ones and stuff like that. I'll buy those. I put them into a system, a wicking bed or a regular garden bed or an ebb and flow bed. They start growing. Now you basically have beet tops, which taste just like, guess what? Swiss chard. You use them for like a half a season and by then you have a giant beet instead of a baby beet. You paid for a little bitty beet. You got a, a great big giant beet, plus you got the greens the whole time. There's all types of things that you can regrow. Once in a while, you might even be in a grocery store, and you'll see living basil. It usually it doesn't have roots. It'll be in a bundle and sitting in water like flowers in water. You take that stuff home. You cut the tender tips off of it. Hit it with a little bit of rooting hormone, sit it in a glass, it'll root, plant it out, and it'll grow. Those of you that do hydroponics in the winter, maybe you got a little bit behind, you want some basil, you don't want to wait for seed, that's the way you can start propagating it from organic basil that you buy in a store. Regrow stuff, guys. Regrow it whenever you can. Uh, and there's some celery right there regrowing as well. Next up, how about micro and mini greenhouses? Yeah, that's right. Micro and mini greenhouses. The picture you're looking at right now is actually from a very old video of mine. This is from a video in 2010. I'll make sure this gets in the podcast notes for you if you want to check it out. The, the stuff on the left side that's really grown heavily in, that's just a bunch of mixed lettuces. And if you look at it, that looks like it's really growing great. It's worth harvesting. And it is. It was delicious. I remember. And then on the right side, you see a kind of similar arrangement of lettuces. And they're tiny. Those are, look how little they are. They're pathetic. They're sad. They're not happy. They're alive. Why? Well, this video was done. I think this is the second video in a series. The first one was done in like February and this was done in late March. And the reason is it's, it's not cold enough to kill the lettuces here in winter, but it is cold enough to make them grow very, very slowly. The way I did that I just took an old fish tank, a 40 gallon breeder fish tank, turned it upside down and put it over the lettuce on the left. And it grew that much more because of the mini greenhouse effect. You can do this with all sorts of things. You can use fish bowls. You can use two liter soda bottles with the bottoms cut off. You can use giant mason jars. Uh, anywhere you go that you see kind of like glass or clear plastic that is one ends open, you can get it cheap or free. You can use this to create mini greenhouses. They work really, really great, folks. And I believe that is it for the presentation material, which means I did leave one off. And I'll back feed to that one, and then we'll keep going forward. Cover crop, cover crop, cover crop, cover crop, guys. 
right now, I wish I, w- I wouldn't have screwed up and left this picture out. My garden looks dead, and it is. But if you dig through it, you have to dig through about four inches of dead material, and then you have to dig through about another two inches of straw, and then you get to the soil underneath. Why? Because I just scattered and, and sowed a cover crop this year. I didn't use the uh, winter hardy Biomaster peas. I had a bunch of an old sweet pea laying around. That gave me a yield for a while. But what happened is I decided this year I wanted a cover crop that when the real hard freeze came, it would just 90% kill it. So it killed it. So now what's going to happen? Now I'm going to go get my wood chips. I'm going to put wood chips on top of the dead material. And by the time it's time to plant in spring, there'll be almost no weeds. And that soil will just be kicking because all that root matters down in there. You can do it that way. You can plant a, a, a cover crop that'll live through your winter. You can plant one that's going to summer kill or, or late spring kill. You can do it however you want, but don't leave your soil fallow through the winter unless you're going to tarp it, which is a suggestion somebody from the community had that we'll get to later. But cover cropping in winter to me, tarping works great. I agree, and I do it sometimes when I don't. if I get behind and I don't get the cover crop in. And tarping will do a lot to protect the soil and prevent weeds from germinating and give you a great fresh start, especially if you you mulch over it and you provide some fertility before you mulch. I agree. The issue is it's not going to put roots down into the soil, which is organic matter that helps build the soil. And it's not going to attract soil critters. They're going to come in and eat those. You can provide organic matter for them, or you can grow the organic matter and take a yield before your crop kills. So I planted turnip. I planted uh, just sweet peas. I planted uh, radishes, a bunch of stuff. And I really expected more of it to survive the uh, the first heavy freeze of the year. It didn't, and I'm okay with that. Uh, and it was my hope that it actually would kill off. It just worked better than I planned. Next up today, how about old pots is plant protection? Anybody out there ever get to the point of the year where you're like, you know what, it's time to put the peppers and tomatoes in the garden bed because I don't think it's going to freeze anymore. Then it doesn't freeze. But what happens, a front moves in and you have sustained winds of about like 28, 30 miles an hour for like three days. And your little plants out there going, I hate my life. Why did you do this to me? And by the time it all ends, all the leaves are tattered and torn. The plant is stunted. Maybe the stem's broken over. And you're like, damn. I've had that happen. I remember the first time I ever had like one of those fronts come in like that. I was out there propping up plywood, trying to build windbreaks and everything. All you do is take the cheapo pots that you can get for free a lot of times or the ones you can buy a case of them for like 15 bucks, the really thin walled ones, cut the bottom off of them and put them over the plant, leaving the top open. But that way they have a windbreak to protect them. Really, really simple. Works really, really well. Just Bury the rim enough so that they don't get blown away in the wind. And uh, for a lot of you that live in climates that you have these windy fronts move in, you know, people call Chicago the windy city. Chicago ain't got jack shit on Dallas-Fort Worth for being windy city. I'm telling you guys, we get spring winds that will absolutely tear your plants up. When I learned this, it just stopped happening. Uh, And there's a lot of different things that you can use, anything like that. But cheap flower pots is a really good way to go. If you ever have any cracked, busted old five-gallon buckets for plants to get a little bit bigger by then, don't throw them away. Cut the bottom off of them and stack them somewhere. By the way, once they're cut the bottom off, they won't stick together and become impossible to take apart. And then just put them somewhere. They won't take up much space. And you can use them as protection for your plants as well. Uh, Someone else says, or a coffee can. Definitely old-school coffee cans. Just take the can opener. Pop the bottom off. If you have the the big like kind of Folgers plastic ones, just cut the bottom off. If you're saving those, don't cut the bottom off until you know that's what you need them for. That way you might be able to use them for something else as well. How about, this is what we just talked about, but I wasn't going to leave it out. I am so jazzed about this. I'm thinking I might actually get a really good tomato harvest this year without the blight killing me off like it does every year. Yep, I'm talking about treating your tomatoes and your beans with aspirin tablets. One aspirin tablet per gallon of water to water in your plants. When you're starting your plants, you use the same ratio and formula. If you're using hydro uh, or aquaponics to do your starts, one tablet per gallon. When you plant your tomatoes out, put one tablet of aspirin in the bottom of the hole. My understanding this works exceptionally well 
to fight off blight and other fungal diseases, specifically in tomatoes and beans, which we always struggle with here. Our beans do great until the, sh the sheer heat of summer comes in and the dry weather comes, and then we get different fungal diseases. Um, but I still able to get a good bean yield. I have never gotten a good tomato yield after the first flush. So I get my tomatoes and then they die and I just give up and I grow other things. This year, I'm hoping to have a much longer term production of tomatoes because uh, they are one of the crops that, like most gardeners, I really do love to grow. Next up, elderberries. Who here has, grows, or harvests elderberries? I bet you a bunch of you guys do. And if you're not harvesting elderberry, you should see if you can find them growing in wild anywhere near you, and you may be able to in much of the United States. If not, you should probably grow at least some elderberry. And you should because they are literally one of the best medicinal crops on planet Earth. Here's the problem. Who's ever picked elderberries? And you come home looking like you, you, you were doing nasty things to a Smurf, right? Your, your fingers are just purple. And it's purple. It, it, it doesn't come off real easy. You try to wash it off with gasoline. You've stained your hands for a couple of days with them. And you can wear gloves, but then you're out. You know, elderberries tend to be available when it's hot out. Who the hell wants to wear even like surgical gloves long term picking elderberries out in the summertime? It's, your hands are sweaty and nasty. That's just nasty, right? So what do you do? You take your pruners, you go out to your elderberries. Everywhere that there is a clump of berries, you take yourself a five-gallon bucket or a garbage can. You just cut the entire cluster off with enough stem that you can grab onto it. You drop it into your container. You take it inside, you throw it in the deep freezer, you wait about 40, 50 minutes of time. The elderberries freeze solid, you take them out, you take a five gallon bucket and you just strip them off and you get no stained hands and the berries just fall off perfectly and then they're ready to be processed however you want to or just throw them back in the freezer for later. Really, really simple, no more purple hands, much better yield, berries come off, leaves don't, you don't fight anything. Simple, easy peasy. Next up, garden along natural, often used paths. There's a lot of things that when we garden, they really need to have us keep an eye on them. And the other thing we want to keep an eye on is emergent weeds. Most people have certain places that they go, and this is zoning and permaculture. You probably go every day or at least a few times a week and you walk a certain path. Garden right along the edges of that path. That way, when you walk that path, Oh, there's a weed, especially if you're on your way out to like let the chickens or ducks out or whatever. Take some stuff, take a little container along with you. I usually have a container for the stuff for the compost for that day. Pull your stuff as you go out, throw it in with your compost, feed the chickens all in one motion. Now you have an empty container on the way back. If there's anything you need to harvest, harvest it and take it home. Now you're working smarter, not harder. Really, really simple. And most of us have certain places we walk. We we go out every day to the mailbox. If you can grow in your front yard without having Karen's wage war against you, you can set some things up to grow right along that path that leads out to your garden. If you walk down your driveway, you're not necessarily going a path with both sides. You know, put in a little border edge on your driveway and grow some things in there. But make make sure you're maximizing and utilizing the places you travel the most. If you're really switched on, what you want to do is find your pathways and make them as level as possible. Dig them out, fill them in with something well draining like lava rock or gravel, then heavily mulch on them. Now when it rains, it's going to seep in evenly on both sides and take care of irrigation and reduce erosion all at the same time. How simple is that? Next up, we are going to talk about next uh, coffee grounds. Some of you guys said that in the social media Posts, but I had already written it down. I love coffee grounds. Coffee grounds make soil better, period. They do not need to be composted. They are not highly acidic. They are not going to cause any problems. All they're going to do is feed lots of worms, contribute organic matter, and increase the tilth and structure in your soil. And I know most of you drink coffee. If you can't tell, I've had a little bit of coffee today. That's why I'm so excited. Uh, actually, I'm excited because of what we're talking about. But yeah, I have, I've had one or two extra cups today. And we use our coffee grounds. But you know what you can do? You can get absolute shit tons of coffee for free. Now, it won't be good for drinking, but it will be good for gardening. Go buy your local Starbucks or any coffee shop and say, hey, I want grinds. Most of the time, the guy will go, hold on, and just turn around and go back in the back and bring you a giant, heavy, wet, sopping bag of coffee grinds that you can barely carry out. Sometimes they actually put grinds out. One of our local Starbucks 
you go in the store, especially around garden season when everybody's asked, they just have bags, about five pounds per bag of wet coffee grinds just sitting there. Take all you want. But if you ask, they'll give them to you. Spread them out in your garden. Spread them out in your lawn. They work. They feed the soil. Remember, as gardeners, we're not feeding plants. We feed soil and soil and soil organisms, and those things then feed the plants. That is the arrangement that we've kind of worked out as gardeners. Coffee grinds, they work. You should be using them. How about dun 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 peel and stick plant prison? What the heck is peel and stick plant prison? Well, it's one of the best uses that there is for peel and stick tile, which is pretty ugly stuff. So way back, this is about the time I did that video with the uh, mini greenhouse out of the fish tank. I wanted to grow bee balm in my garden at the garden that I had in Arlington, Texas. And I wanted to grow it right in the middle of the garden. I didn't want it to escape. And I didn't want to bury a pot. I just wanted it to grow right in the same soil as the garden. I was thinking, how do I do this without hating my life and letting it invade the rest of the thing and becoming like a weed? And I wanted it there because of the predators uh, and pollinators that it would bring in. And it's a plant I love to grow. Well, I was at either Lowe's or Home Depot, probably with that place would have been the Home Depot. And I found this peel and stick floor tile that looks like wood plank. So they're about three foot long. And you peel the back and you stick them on the floor. And it looks like you have a wood floor for, I don't know, a year or two before they start to curl up and look stupid. And they're very, very cheap because well, they're marked to people who don't have enough money to put in a proper wooden floor. So I looked at that and said, self, I bet you can do something with it. So I bought, I think, uh, eight of them. And with each pair of two, I made a ring. And then I stuck them together onto themselves. And it made a perfect little prison. And I dug a hole in the dead center of my garden, the part that was hardest to reach, where I didn't want to do a lot of work. And I buried that in the ground and I backfilled the center and I planted beautiful multicolored bee balm right in the middle of it. I left about an inch and a half up above the soil line so I wouldn't have runners coming out. I grew that until we moved to Arkansas. So that would have been like three years. Never had an escapee. Now you do have to keep an eye out for some runners coming over the top. Real easy to prune off and use for tea. But you can use that for mints or any other perennial that you want to prevent from running. And it doesn't have to be peel and stick. That's just what I did. Remnant of a, of a, um, a pond liner would do that. Uh, anything that's thick and it's not going to biodegrade in the ground will do that for you. Uh, next up, how about uh, weed and comfrey tea for fertilizer? So I am huge on growing comfrey. I, comfrey. I grow comfrey all over the place. I don't worry about comfrey kind of weeding out in my gardens. I don't put it in prison. I'll grow that right in the middle of my annual gardens. It starts to go out. I just pull it off and, 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 and use it. Um, and weeds as well. Like we have weeds that pop up everywhere. Weeds are actually great dynamic accumulators, meaning they actually take a lot of minerals that are in the soil that maybe other plants are not as adept at acquiring. And so you can take comfrey and weeds or just weeds or just comfrey, soak it in a bucket of water for a couple of days, and then use that water as a fertility aid in your garden. It's simple. It's free. It takes almost no effort whatsoever. And the comfrey, when you're done doing it, just go ahead and spread that around your garden. It's going to stink, by the way. They call it green manure, and it smells like manure and not like fresh, you know, composted manure. It smells almost like, uh, like septic manure. You're not going to like the smell of it, but it's not going to last very long water in your plants. If you do weeds without comfrey, in most instances, unless you find some weed I don't know about, they're not going to stink. So go ahead and water that in and then take those wet weeds and throw it in your compost for your chickens or your other livestock. Um, those chickens might eat the comfrey. I just, I don't know, guys, you try it, you'll see what I mean. It's, it's, it's pretty gnarly. Uh, next up today, seed spacing jigs. Let's say that you're going to go and you're going to direct sow beans. And the little label says that they should be sowed, you know, every two inches and then thinned to every four inches when the sprouts come up. Problem with that is, you know, what you end up with is two or three in a row that don't come up. So you end up with a big gap. Plus you're sitting there, I don't know, measuring or trying to figure it out or whatever. What you do is you take yourself something like a little piece of two by four and then you take some big heavy duty nails 
and you drill, you, you nail them in spaced four inches apart. And now you have a four inch planting jig. You take that and you stamp it into your ground, wiggle it back and forth, move it to the, and then you put the last one, the last nail or the first nail in the last hole to overlap. And you end up with perfectly spaced holes. Now, instead of putting it every two inches and trying to thin out in between, put two in every hole. That way, odds are one of them will come up, and when two come up, just pinch one off when you're ready to thin out. Now they're perfectly spaced every time. And I know people are going to be like, well, why don't you make some kind of configurable jig or something? It's not worth the freaking effort. You're going to find that you only have a couple different spacing arrangements that you ever do. When I'm doing plants instead of seeds, and I'm like setting out tomato plants or whatever, honestly, what I do is I, you know, I'll find my, I get my tape measure and I just lay it on the ground. Uh, the other thing that I've done is you cut a piece of bamboo cane and just leave it out in your garden. And whenever you're planting, there's an 18 inch space cane or a 12 inch space cane. Both of those work really, really well. Uh, by the way, another great thing for drilling holes when you're only doing a few things, a little piece of rebar drills, perfect holes in your soil for you. All right, next up, what do we got here? How about spot killing pests with either soap or oil, and there is a right answer to which one do you use, and do not use both at the same time. So, if you have soft bot, this is for spot killing. In other words, I look, I see aphids on this thing, and I want them dead. If you do this without spot killing, it's not that you're going to kill everything, it's that you're going to kill nothing, because these are not persistent in their ability to kill. They are a contact killer. So what we want to use again soap for is your soft bodied pests. So aphids and things like that. If you have hard body pests, you want to use an oil based insecticide. You can make both of these yourself. To make your soap based insecticide, use about 2.5 tablespoons to a gallon of water. Put it in a spray bottle and spray your pests with it. A lot of people are like, you only use organic soap or use this soap or use that soap. Yeah, maybe. Here's how I look at it. If you're willing to use that soap to wash the dish that you're going to eat off of, then you should be willing it to use pests, to kill pests in your garden. If you're really worried it's going to contaminate your food and you're washing your, your dishes with it, you see what I mean. So what you're comfortable with using in your home, you should be comfortable with using in your garden. And that works really well. For your hard body pests, the best thing that I've found, and I make soil drench with this to kill ants, is orange oil. The problem using orange oil in a spray that you kind of, you know, you mix up or shake up is it's an oil. It's an oil. And what happens when we put oil and water together? They separate. So what we need to do is create an emulsion. Do you know what creates an emulsion? Mustard. Do you know what plants don't or uh, bugs don't like? Mustard. Do you know what plants don't care about? Mustard. Now, we don't want to go squirting, you know, uh, Frenches into that jug, though, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to use about one to two tablespoons of orange oil. Start on the lighter side so you're less likely to have any stunted growth on your plants. You use as much as you need if, you, if it doesn't work. But start with one tablespoon of orange oil to a gallon of water and use about a half of a tablespoon of dry mustard. Throw that in your bottle. Give it a good shake. And you can adjust that down if you're using like a quart spray bottle, which is what I use. I don't need a lot of this. And uh, use that on your hard-bodied insects. So, and I would just put it this way. You spray something with soap, and you know it's not killing it, switch to the orange oil. Both work perfectly, completely organic, not going to cause any problems. A great way to deter pest is using garlic pepper tea. And we make this up with a couple heads of garlic and a couple really hot peppers. The hotter, the better. Something like habaneros. You throw them in a blender. You blend it up. You make a, a gallon of concentrate. And you use a quart of the concentrate to a gallon of water to make your spray. So a gallon of concentrate actually makes four gallons of treatment. You spray this on all your things to get mutilated by pests, and it helps mitigate pest damage. They don't really want to eat it as much. Uh, that I got from Howard Garrett. I've been using it a long time. It works really well. In the notes, I have a link where you can get over to learn the recipe and the technique for using that. Also for, for, uh, from Howard Garrett, there is a miracle product. It will reduce diseases, especially fungal diseases. It will help control some pests. 
It will help kick off your composting, and it does about four other things really great, and you can get it just about anywhere. It's cornmeal. And you use different forms of cornmeal for different applications, and all of these things are probably better than eating that stuff because it's one of the most nutrient-poor things that human beings can consume as food for human beings, but it works really good in the garden. It's the redemption of corn. And Howard Garrett, again, has an article on how you use it for all these things. And I put a link in the audio notes so that you can get on over there and take a look at it. But using cornmeal, and the main thing that it's worked for me is helping to control some fungal diseases with direct application on soil and also through making cornmeal tea. I don't actually know the the biological action that causes it to work. And it doesn't seem like anybody really does uh, for as far as the fungal control. We just know that it works. I don't think there's been enough research done on it yet. Also, in certain forms, it can be used as a pre-emergent herbicide. And that means we can take corn gluten meal, for instance, and spread that out around our plants once they're up and it won't affect them at all. But it, it has a uh, detrimental effect on seed germination of weed species. So we can use this as a pre-emergent herbicide as well. Again, all that stuff is available on Dr. Garrett's. Well, he's not Dr. Garrett. He's a dirt doctor, but he's not a real doctor website. And I have links to both of them. Uh, next, watering. If you have to water, like with a hose, and your plants are going to get wet, you have a real potential for causing fungal diseases and also for having spot burn as those little droplets and the sun shines through them like little magnifying glasses burn your leaves. So the best time to water is after the heat of the day or before the heat of the day. That's kind of when you want to water. If you have a choice, if you have the time in your mornings, and if you're using automated irrigation, which we'll talk about more in just a bit, that is going to spray some on the leaves and above the ground, if you're not doing drip or subsurface, then you want to set your automation to go off in the mornings. And if you are hand watering, it's best if you can water in the mornings. If you can't, better off water in the evening than not at all. Why? Okay, so if we water in the morning, we get we don't end up with wet plants with heavy sun on. We already know that, right? But what we, we also end up with is we have time for the plant to dry. And as the sun comes up, it dries the rest of the way out. And we don't have wet leaves for like, you know, 10 hours overnight. If we water after the sun goes away and we do that in the evening, then we've wet down our leaves and they're staying wet overnight. And we increase the opportunity for fungal diseases. So I'm not saying not to water at night. I'm saying you're better off watering first thing in the morning if you can. Next up, uh, we have pond plant fertilizer. If you guys have seen my videos, you know I'm big on this. If, if you can have a small backyard pond, whether it's a garden pond, an in-ground pond, whatever, Grow aquatic vegetation. Pick something that'll do well for you, and then think about if you have a department of making you sad with certain things banned, whether you want to grow it or not, what the risk factor is there, and what have you. But I grow water hyacinth, and it grows like crazy, and I feed it to my ducks, and they love it. But the other thing I do with it is I just put it on my plants all the time. And because it's basically water hyacinth is mostly water. It's cellulose and these little air balloons of water in it. So you put the plants there and you get all the nutrient effect from the roots and from the cellulose and the structure of the plant. But the other thing is once that plant's out of water, it literally starts to just deflate and the water goes out of it and it actually waters the plants. I make compost with it. Uh, I also use a plant called uh, water lettuce and I use uh, azola, which is a nitrogen fixer. I use duckweed, but I don't care what it is. In fact, I bet you somewhere near you, there's probably somebody with a little stock tank and every year it gets overgrown with, with vegetation. And I bet you they'd let you go out there with something like a, uh, a pool rake, which is basically you make something that will sink down into the soil or into the water that you can pull out with a rope. And you throw that in and you start dragging that stuff out of there. Go load up a pickup truck load of that stuff. Throw it in your compost heap. Throw it on your, on your soil. There is so much nutrient in any sort of aquatic vegetation. And it breaks down incredibly easy and it does so much for soil quality. It is unbelievable the improvement you'll get in soil quality. And you, you can't use too much of it and you are going to end up with a lot less uh, of a compost remaining than you think you will. That, uh, that wire basket I showed earlier is three foot tall. I completely filled it with packed 
down water hyacinth. And I ended up with about two inches of what was left over at the end of that composting just to see what it was. So you can't use too much of it. You're not going to burn anything. You're not going to hurt anything. And what even looks like a giant pile will deflate to almost nothing. And it's going to leach all of those minerals and nutrients into your soil. Next up, if you, because I hear all the time when we talk about tomatoes, eggshells. I take an eggshell and I put it down in the hole for my tomato plant. I've done that too. And you know what else I do? A lot of investigations to how well things worked. And when I take like two egg, you crack your egg in half, you put your two egg shells together and you throw it in your thing. And then you, you grab that thing and you take it outside and you're planting your tomato plant and you put your two egg shells like that in the hole and you put your tomato in it. Guess what you're going to find in the fall when that tomato plant's done and you dig it up? Two egg shells that look almost like they did when you put them in the ground, right? That's... That's that's what you're going to find. I promise you because I've done it. I've pulled eggshells out of the middle of compost piles as long as they weren't hot compost piles that were over a year old and they were still whole. If you're going to use eggshells in soil for tomato plants or any other plant to supplement calcium, at minimum, take those eggshells in your hand and crumble them up. And if you do that, when you dig it up, you're not going to find little crumbles of eggshells that completely dissipates into the soil. And I don't believe you're getting much of a calcium boost when you put a whole eggshell into the soil because the eggshell looks the same as it did when you bury it. What the magic is of creating that additional surface area exactly, I don't know, but I know they break down. I know an even better way, though. Get your neutron ninja or what have you, throw a whole ass load of eggshells in there and grind a bunch of it up so it looks like bone meal. Dump it into some sort of an airtight container because it's really dusty at that point. You don't want it in your nose. It smells like ground up bone. Calcium is what it is. And throw a tablespoon or a teaspoon of that into your soil when you plant your calcium uh, intensive plants. Trust me on this. I have experimented and I can tell you for a fact you need to crush it up. Next, what about all those tools that you have? You know, you have that trowel, you have that little digger or what have you, and you want to keep them nice and rust free and clean and dry. Wherever you store your hand tools, get yourself a bucket. Fill it up with sand, wet the sand down with mineral oil, stick your tools in the sand. It will keep them clean. It will keep them dry. It will keep them rust free. And every time you stick them in and pull them out, it give a little bit kind of a polish and a sharpening. Real simple, real easy to do. You can also do it with like uh, perlite. Perlite works real well, but it doesn't seem to kind of hold on to the mineral oil the way uh, that sand does. Just plain old like play sand. Bucket of play sand, keep your tools in it. Not out in the rain, by the way, but like anywhere protected from overhead. Your tools will last for damn near ever that way. Uh, next up today, if you're not big into composting or you're just not producing enough waste to compost, a lot of people will default to a worm farm. And that's not a bad thing, and it's a good thing if you have worms and you're going to take care of them whatever, uh, and you're not worried about ants invading your worm bit or what have you, your significant other is not uh, uncomfortable with you having worms in the house or whatever. You know the easiest way to farm worms to compost and to support your plants, though? Take all your compostable stuff, all your greens is what we would call them, even if they're not the color green, all your wet nitrogen stuff, all your food waste, put it in a little compost container, and once a day, a couple times a week, what have you, go out to your garden, look for plants. So that plant looks like it can use a little kick. Pull your mulch back and stick your banana peels or whatever it is directly on the soil. Put the mulch back over it. If you take a whole banana peel and bury it under your mulch in a garden, assuming you haven't killed all life in your garden, you haven't toxified your garden, come back in two days, three tops, and pull that mulch up and find a piece of that banana peel. I dare you. It will be gone. The soil organisms will consume it. They'll poop right where they're eating, and they will increase the fertility, and it's almost no work. It's also the kind of thing that you know what you can do? You can teach a child how to do that. You can start handing off responsibilities to your kids as young as possible. Pull up the mulch, put the stinky banana peel under it, and cover it. It's not beyond the capability of a child. I've had my five-year-old granddaughter do it. She thinks it's fun. If a five-year-old can do it, your kids can probably do it too. Next up today, one of my favorite crops to grow. I almost don't eat it all. In fact, the only thing I really eat off it, other than daikon, 
uh, where I, would, I do use the roots is radishes. I'm not a huge fan of radishes. But you know what they're great for? They're one of the best insect trap crops that there is, meaning that there's a lot of kind of leaf miner insects that just love to eat radishes and radishes don't care. So if you interplant radishes with plants that generally have problems with like leaf miners and flea beetles and stuff like that, they actually prefer the radishes so they go there. I know what you're thinking, but Jack, then if I do that, you know what I'm doing? I'm growing my pest population. Your pest population is either eating your lettuce or your radish leaves. Which one do you prefer? And then we have to think Serengeti. I always try to get people when it comes to pest insects thinking like we're managing the Serengeti. If you were trying to manage lions on the Serengeti and you make sure you had good, healthy populations of lions, what would happen to the lions if you went out and killed all the wildebeest and all the zebras and all the impalas and all the antelope? Well, all your lions would starve to death and die, or more likely they'd be like, screw this, and they would go somewhere else, like down to the village and start eating people. If they get hungry enough, that's what they do. Ask people from the area, and they'll tell you. They don't have to be sick and maimed to take people. If there's nothing else for them to eat, we're giant hairless monkeys, and they will eat us. right? So they're either going to leave, choose a different food source, or die. So if you want ladybugs and lace wings and all those great predators and spiders and all that stuff living in your garden and eating pests, there has to be enough of a pest population to support the predator population. By giving the pest something to eat that they prefer, then the predator just is like, oh, look at that. Look at that. Isn't that delicious? And then you get, because we're never going to eliminate all our pests. That's not our goal. It's to keep them in control that we can grow enough food that we don't care about our losses. Trap crops are one really great way to do that. Seed organization. Had some questions about this one recently. I have the most stupid, simple seed organization philosophy possible. I used to keep all my seeds in like a file folder with alphabet and all kinds of crap. And I realized, you know what, Jack, you're just not that guy. You can set up organizational structure. You just can't keep it that way. So I came up with the most dead simple way that works on the way that I think to organize my seeds. I have a box. All my seeds go in one box. In that box are four great big Ziploc bags, and they have a label on them. Warm weather pots, warm weather direct, and you guessed it, cold weather pots and cold weather direct. And those mean a little bit different things of flexibility within them, but basically it works like this. I'm not going to direct sow peppers and tomatoes. I'm always going to start peppers and tomatoes indoors in a pot of some sort or maybe a little hydro pellet or something like that. So they go in the warm weather pot bag. So if I'm looking for peppers and tomatoes, all I have to do is look at those four bags and pull out the warm weather pots bag. Boom. I got it. There it is. If I'm looking for something like warm weather, warm weather direct, meaning I'm going to direct so my cucumbers are going to be in there. My beans are in there. Well, Jack, what if you decide you actually want to start some cucumbers early this year? That's all right. I know that I normally direct sow them, so they're in there. My winter stuff, you know, things like uh, lettuce and stuff like that's all going to be in the co cool weather direct. So maybe there's some things. There's the very the, the smallest bag is the cool weather indoors, but like broccoli, I'll always start. So things like that. Just by doing that, I'm able to find whatever I'm looking for without really thinking about it because you're down to four bags. They're clear bags. So you can see what's in there. You can rifle through them really, really quickly. But here's another thing. When you have a little seed envelope and you leave your, your seeds in it, and you probably should, take a little piece of scotch tape and tape that sucker closed or you end up with a ton of seeds that you don't know what they are in the bottom of that Ziploc bag. Really, really super easy. Next up, bet this is one you haven't heard before. Uh, maybe the sunflower part, but not the sorghum part. I like to grow sorghum and sunflower right in my vegetable gardens. Not heavy density for, for planting uh, or for harvesting directly. But I might, you know, in the back row of a garden, you know, your back row where you have trellising things go up, I might plant, you know, one Mennonite or giant white African sorghum every footish because they grow straight and tall and they don't really shade anything out. Beans can go up around them or whatever. But the best part, they produce a great big head of seed. Take that seed, cut it off, throw it in a bag. That's feed for my livestock. But you know what you could do with sorghum? You can't do this with the sunflowers, by the way. Once the sorghum produces a head, a head of seed, you plant it really early in your climate. You live in a long growing system. You take a pair of pruners. 
you cut the sorghum off about six inches from the bottom of the soil. So it's only sitting like a little six inch stub sitting there. You take your pruners and you take your stock of sorghum and you cut it in little pieces. And you just throw it right into your garden. You know what you've just done? You've done a great service to your soil. Your soil is now going to be infused with the minerals and soil. Back in the Great Depression, when kids were becoming nutrient and vitamin deficient, uh, doctors were actually prescribing a spoon of sorghum syrup every day for your kids because there's so much minerals in sorghum. So now you've repopulated those minerals back to your garden. You've done a couple seconds worth of work to do it. You've produced a yield for your livestock because chickens, geese, and ducks all love sorghum, right? You don't have to, you know, separate it off the thing. I just throw it in a bag, a bag, like a, like a, a burlap bag, like for onions and hang it up in the barn. Right. And then it's, it's it dries out. And when you want to feed it to your birds, you just reach in and throw a couple pieces of it out to them. Totally easy, totally simple. And you've taken up nothing. You've taken nothing from anything. I do the same thing with sunflowers, except you're not going to be able to have them regrow from the ground. At least I haven't found that you have. But you cut the heads off the sunflowers. That's feed for your wildlife or for your native birds. And then you cut the stalk up and you've added another source of biomatter and you've left a huge root mass. And it's basically like a cover crop that doesn't take up space during the main growing season. Now, some people will tell you, oh, sunflowers, my sunflowers are allelopathic and they'll kill other plants. I have not noticed that. I have not found that to be a problem. If you find that there's, it causes some sensitivity in certain plants, don't grow those plants. But generally speaking, plants that are in the Helanthus uh, uh, family, which is where sunflower is, they can be a bit oleopathic. It's a short-term oleopathic situation, and it's generally from them dropping leaves onto the soil, not stalks. So if, you, if you're worried about that, cut your leaves off of your sunflower and do something else with it. But I haven't found any ill effects in my gardens by growing sunflower radium. In fact, since the sunflower is much more of a long-term, not cut to the ground until the end of the season crop, I generally plant beans and I allow them to go up my sunflowers and I generally grow the great big tall sunflowers and I take the leaves about halfway up off. So you have a bare stalk with your, your beans going up. And so it's like three sisters, two thirds and using sunflower instead of corn. Why not corn? Because corn is a much bigger plant than sorghum that grows kind of in that straight column, but you could do corn that way too, I guess, if you wanted to. You're probably not going to get real good pollination with corn spaced out that much as well, though. But I found that sorghum doesn't care. You can plant two sorghum canes and you get plenty of yield on your grain. Uh, next up, mulch like crazy, guys. And a lot of people said mulch, mulch, mulch uh, when I said, what are your hacks? And we all know that mulch is good. But my big hack on this is how to get free wood chips. Now, I know people are going to tell me, go to chip, Chipped In. I think it's C-H-I-P-E-D dot I-N. I've been there. I filled out the form a bunch of times, a lot of times, zero wood chips. If you live somewhere where the people that are landscaping and doing tree work and all that they use it and you can get wood chips delivered with chipped in, do it. I have not. But what I have found is if I'm driving around and I see a truck and it's got a great big old wood chipper behind it, and they're topping trees or whatever, clearing them for the state or whoever it is, and they're throwing them through that wood chipper into that truck, and, and I'm within a couple miles of my house when I see them, and I stop and go, hey, where are, you guys gonna, where are you guys gonna dump those chips? Nine times out of 10, they're like, we're gonna go to this place that we're gonna have to pay to take them. And if I say, hey, you know what? You can pull into my place and dump them right down the road, and I'll put a marker out. So if I'm not there when you get there, you can just dump them. They'll just do it. And if they don't do it, I'm like, well, how, how much fits in, the, in those big trucks? Usually it's like four yards. Now, four yards would cost me about 80 bucks to buy. So I'm like, well, will you take 20 bucks for them? And that'll usually get it done. And what also gets it done a lot, and really this is more of a get them to come back thing. When I ask someone to do it, and they just say, yeah, we can do that. A lot of times they'll say we have big logs in there too and all, because they just chunk up the big logs and throw them in the truck. So it's a lot of times people don't want them because they're rough cut instead of fine cut wood chips, and they have some big old logs in them. Big logs are hoosier culture. Big logs are firewood. Big logs are material that you can do projects with. Big logs do not bother me. So I'm like, yeah, just dump it. And when they say sure and they come do that, depending on how much they're bringing me, I go get them a 12-pack or two of beer. Now you do that and you become beer dude. And once you're beer dude for construction works, let me tell you something. I used to work work like that. 
when it is six o'clock in the afternoon and you have busted your ass since six o'clock in the morning, you've worked 12 hours and you are tired and ice cold beer, even a shitty Coors Light, which is most of the Coors Light, Miller Light, Bud Light. Those are the three beers that the, most of those guys drink, right? Um, man, it makes your day and you don't forget that somebody did it for you. And most of those guys are going to stop on the way from home, on the way home and pick up a six pack. Now it's two less things they have to do. One, they don't have to go to the materials place and get rid of it and pay for it, which they, they generally don't care about paying for it unless it's like an owner operator, small business, right? Because they're not paying for it, but they have to go there. They have to wait in line. They have to do all that. And they don't have to stop at the, at the corner beer store. They've already got some beer. And the next time you see them in your area and you're like, hey, man, I, they're like, we got you, bro. You don't even have to, you don't even have to, they remember you, like remember your vehicle. They only have, you don't have to explain yourself. And I'll just say, once you get them doing that, don't forget to keep giving them beer. If you're not going to be around, put the box of beer next to the wood, where you want the wood chips uh, dumped. They'll know what to do with it. Be beer dude. I'm telling you. Next up, maximize the use of Eastern sun in hot climates. Now, this may not be the case. For instance, when I was in Pennsylvania, the sun is way less intense than it is here in Texas. And especially plants that like a lot of sun, you wanted to maximize the solar exposure. You wanted them to have sun from the time it came up till it went down. I remember my wife used to grow marigolds in a little flower garden out in front of our house in Pennsylvania. And the, the shade of the house hit just the edge of the where the marigold beds were for like just the last hour and a half. So it was most of the day, full sun, all of it. And you could see a big difference in the growth rate of the marigolds in the full sun all day and the ones that got about 90 minutes of shade. So it, it depends. But in Texas, Georgia, Florida, anywhere in the deep south where you have, you know, your summer days, instead of like Pennsylvania, like five o'clock at night, the temperature started to go down. You know what happens at five o'clock at night in Texas? Temperature starts to keep going up and the damn temperature will go up all the way to like nine o'clock at night in the summer. And it'll still be freaking near 100 degrees at midnight. So the plants need a break. So kind of the best case scenario where I live at my latitude is if you can have a place where as soon as the sun comes up, it hits the garden almost immediately. But about 3 to 3.30, maybe 4 o'clock at the latest, it goes into shade. That garden is going to rock and roll. So you always want to look at your solar aspects. You always want to look at your shadow mapping. You always want to consider that for your climate. But I'm telling you folks in the South, if you're the person that even though you're doing irrigation properly, you're not watering too much, you're not watering too little, and you come home from work six o'clock in the evening and your plants look sad, but they look happy every morning. And if you go out once the sun is behind everything, they look happy and they just look sad from like four o'clock to seven o'clock. And then they look happy again, too much sun. So if we relocate the garden or place some things in there that will provide shade after three o'clock, you got to think about it. Your sun's coming up at that time of year, full full up over the you know over the next house or whatever. For most of the areas around here, about six thirty seven. So if you're going to three o'clock, you're getting a full eight hours of sun. And in our climate, eight hours of our sun is like freaking eleven hours of sun up north. It just really is, especially that time of year. So maximize the use of that eastern shade. Overwinter sweet potato as a house plant. Stop dealing with a sweet potato every spring. Stick it in a glass of water and wait for your little slips to come out and slipping them off. Just go out to your garden when everything's still happy. Cut some sweet potato uh, tr trimmings off. Root them by putting them in some water. Put them in a houseplant pot, keep them indoors. On nice days when it's sunny out, put your pot outdoors so it gets some more sun. And then in the, and when it's going to freeze overnight, bring it inside. Just a little pot about the size of like half of a five, like two and a half gallon pot. Then you're going to have really heavy growth. Plant five or six or seven. It makes a pretty house plant. Then when spring comes and you're ready to put your sweet potatoes out, just cut, take cuttings root them and put them out in the garden. They'll have no, no real transplant shock. They won't go through a bunch of misery. And if you use those little baskets that I talked about to harden them off, they'll get off to a really quick start. Now you're going to get a tuber crop and a green crop instead of dealing with the crap of making slips that way every year. 
And once you get one plant going, you know if you've ever grown sweet potatoes, you can make as many as you want. I take them, I put them on the air stacks in my ponds. I even sell them to neighbors once in a while because you can sell, you know, a bundle of 10 sweet potato slips. I, I sell that for five bucks and it takes me about three seconds of actual work to make it. And I take orders so I don't make any more than I need. I'll, I'll go on next door and say, hey, I'm making sweet potato slips this year. They're purple Japanese sweet potatoes. They're five dollars for a bundle of 10. If you want them, I need to know in the next couple of days and they'll be ready in three weeks. And boom. And I don't ever play around with actually trying to make sweet potato, like whole sweet potatoes produce slips at all anymore, period. It is that simple. Next up, we are almost done. We've got a bonus. Use my seven-part fertility program. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but it involves calcium and magnesium in a chelated form. And that's used only when you, when you observe something that tells you you need to do it and iron and zinc also in a chelated form. And I actually use products for those minerals that are designed for hydroponic systems because they're immediately available to the plant. And we only use them on plants that exhibit certain symptoms. That's all written up on my website. Uh, I have a page with everything in the fertility program there. And there's some other things, but there's two things in that program that I would tell you, you really should do it. If you do just those two things, it won't work as good as doing them all, but it'll work really great. One is Dr. Earth um, Gold Fertilizer. It is the best organic fertilizer, microorganisms, etc., that I, I have ever found. I have tried dozens of different varieties. It works incredible. It has beneficial microorganisms in it. And if you're a member of my MSB, you get a discount on it. I have a 10% discount on everything uh, that, that Dr. Earth does. And there are some formulas they have that are more specific to certain types of plants or certain uh, vegetable varieties and stuff like that. And you can use those if you want to, but the, but the gold is the best all around stuff that they have. It's a 444 fertilizer, meaning it is completely balanced in NPK. It has the other micronutrients. It has the, uh, the beneficial microorganisms, the fungi and the beneficial bacteria. It's got it all. With the discount, it's a great price. A little goes a long way. You use that. And then the second one is Garrett Juice, and specifically Garrett Juice Plush with fish. Uh, I do have links on it to my site where you can buy it on Amazon if you can't get it locally. That is a product I recommend if you can get it locally. And it is widely available now because it's marketed. Uh, Garrett, he licensed it to a company called Medina. And they are in most of the box stores and stuff like that. So you can probably find it locally because it's expensive because shipping a gallon of liquid is expensive. Those two alone will solve a lot of your problems. If you use the garlic pepper tea and the cornmeal treatments that Dr. Uh, I'm sorry, Dirt Dr. Howard Garrett recommends, uh, it will be even better. Now, what about you guys? You guys are like, hey, Jack, we have some ideas too. So here they are. And I'll say as I read these, if you have questions or suggestions, put them in all caps. I've been marking some of them as we go, but I've been really going fast here. So I probably missed a lot of it. But I'm going to go real quick through this. Transplant wild edibles. Christopher on me, we suggested that. Good dude, known him a long time, and he's right. Like, I'm big on bringing wild, different versions of wild garlic onto the property. I don't plant them in the garden so much, but if you have something that grows will, really well in the wild, just do like our ancestors did when all this started. Go out and take cuttings, bring in roots, dig up plants when they're dormant. If they're perennials, bring them in, plant them. And the, if you're taking care of them, they're going to do even better than living out in the wild where they have to take care of themselves. Uh, Mike, on me, we went through a, some different types of versions of this, but the basic suggestion, and several other people said it too, and I agree, is automate irrigation. You think you're going to take care of everything. If you automate your irrigation, a lot of your problems will go away for two reasons. You won't forget and you won't over-irrigate. These are the two things that happen most. A lot. What happens is people don't water, and then they compensate by overwatering. And overwatering can actually cause as much harm as underwatering. We want plants putting down deep roots. We do not want to create soppy soil and anaerobic conditions. We want the soil to stay light, fluffy, and aerobic. Uh, so it's got a lot of oxygen. In it, and we want a soil life. Remember, the soil life is more important than the soil. So we want the soil in a condition that the life does well. That means it needs to be cool, not baked in the sun. Our mulch is going to do that for us. We want good tilth and structure. Proper irrigation keeps the tilt, the structure, reduces stress in the plants. So automate your irrigation. He was big on drip. Drip doesn't work for everybody. Drip doesn't work for me. 
I try to do drip irrigation here, clog drippers, I promise you, because of how hard my water is. So, but one way or another, automate your irrigation. Uh, Andy Amiwi, late, his, his whole thing was label, 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 because you, 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 you lose track of things. Yeah, I agree. And I would say things that are really important that you know what they are, two labels, not one. So if you're making six packs and it's all like a certain variety of pepper, you put a label on one side of it, same label on the other side of it. Um, it's not as big a deal for a lot of us um, that are more of the interplant permaculture types, because even if I label everything, all I know is that's a pepper. When it starts producing peppers, I know what kind of pepper it is. Right. So and I, and if you ask me between when I plant it and when I harvest it, what kind of pepper it is, I probably don't remember. You know, but if you're doing more of kind of grouping plantings, like all my jalapenos are here, all of my banana peppers are here, all of my habaneros are here, all of my bonnie sweet peppers are here, then you you probably really want to pay attention to labeling. Um, another thing with labeling is it, it lets you know when something didn't work, what didn't work. So everything's growing and you got one flat of peppers that didn't germinate at all. Were those my jalapenos or my maconis? So I, I agree with it. It's just maybe not as important when it comes to the practical aspects of putting plants out. Um, tarps not tilling from Dave on Miwi. So instead of cover cropping, what Dave's doing at the end of the season, he's covering his garden beds with a tarp and he's leaving it over the season. And that way you don't have any weeds come up. And when you go to plant, you have nice, tilthy, beautiful soil. This works really good. I do prefer cover crops because I'm actively building soil organisms throughout the whole season. And I'm, it, it, you know, cover crops are cheap. And if you look at what you're doing with a, with a daikon radish, for instance, you know, it grows about that long, grows about two foot long and it dies. And then it leaves a rotted core and then worms come and eat it. And then they poop. And you have to ask yourself if I can spend like 50 cents on daikon seed and I can make 500 holes full of worm castings, what would somebody charge me to come out with a post hole digger, dig me 500 holes and fill it up with worm castings? And it's a hell of a lot more than 50 cents or a dollar. So cover cropping works really good. But if you don't want to do it, your system's not right for it, what have you, then tarping I've done as well. And it works really, really well. My advice, if you're going to rely on tarping, put down a nice coating of something like a Dr. Earth fertilizer. Any other organic matter you have, including like an old bag of chicken feet, then put down a mulch, either wood chips or like a straw mulch. Water that in really good and then tarp it. And then you and, and maybe even a little bit of, uh, uh, what am I trying to say now? Uh, like like uh, dry molasses, like uh, agricultural molasses will work really well for you. All right, let's try to keep it going. Um, this is one I had never thought of, but it makes perfect sense. Michael on me, we says, go to your local grocery store that sells flowers, you know, where they have a little, uh, like florist for like guys that are stupid and they're in trouble. So they buy their, their wife flowers on the way home to get out of trouble. Or guys like me that don't get into trouble because we buy flowers for our wife on the way home. Like that kind of little florist that's just sitting there. Apparently those guys get in like flower pots out the butt, like little cheap ones that are good for starting plants in. And they throw them away on a daily basis. And you can get almost unlimited flower pots uh, by going to those uh, those floors. And I found that in grocery stores, the people that take care of that section of grocery stores seem pretty happy. And they're pretty affable people. And they're pretty easy to talk to. So it's probably easy to do. Um, Susan on me, we said she is a heavy-duty office shredder. She takes light cardboard, all paper products, anything that's not plastic or laminate. She puts it through there and she throws that into her compost to feed her compost. And that, yeah, that works real well. Cattle panels and T-posts for trellises was suggested by Kate on Miwi and Bell Snickel and Restiva on float. All three of those folks uh, suggested that. I think it's a fantastic idea. I certainly do it. Cattle panels make amazing trellises. I'll tell you another thing you can do. You take something like your two by six uh, long oval cattle panels and you make those into a wicking bed and you set two of them about six foot apart and then you just take a cattle panel, which was which is about four to five foot wide, depending on what, whether you buy hog or cattle. And there's those beds will be so heavy, you just push one side of the cattle panel up against one side, and then it just makes a perfect arch between the two uh, stock tanks. And a lot of times, if you are in a situation where you're not really going to do a wicking bed, but you just want raised beds, you can find those old um, stock tanks. Usually, they'll rust out the bottom. 
and people want to get rid of them and they'll give them away for free. Or you can just make galvanized raised beds and do this or any form of raised bed. If it's at least two foot high, you're going to get a lot of stability. All you have to do is just pop that cattle panel and you'll find anywhere from about four foot to about six foot will make a nice arch that you can walk underneath. Uh, next up, uh, Mint Prison Pots, says Eric on MeWe. So I talked about using this peel and stick or a uh, pond liner to make a prison for things like mints. What he does when he wants to plant mint right out in his garden and use it in the garden and make it part of the garden but doesn't want it to invade, he just takes flower pot and buries it in the soil. That works too. You know what works even better? Take a flower pot, bury it in the soil, don't fill it in. Take another flower pot, put your mint in it, and nest it in there. And that way, when you want to take it out or move it around, you just pop it out and it's still in the soil and it stays open for you. Uh, next up, make friends with livestock owners if you don't have any for waste manure. Clyde on me, he says, I don't like to pay for poop. People are more than happy to give it to you. I would agree with that one. Um, mass planting madness. That's what I call it from Miller on MeWe. Basically, what he says is he just takes an area, cuts the sod out, throws a whole shitload of different summer veggies down, throws mulch over it, waters it in with some organic fertilizer, and lets it grow. And it produces kind of successionally, like, okay, the squash ran out this way, and, you know, this thing with the greens here, and he makes little clumps of those. Sounds like a good way to go. I've done that right in prepared garden beds as well. Um, tie into local wisdom. Talk to older gardeners and farmers from bending reeds on float. I completely agree. I completely agree. The more local wisdom you can find. I'm telling you, when you talk to somebody and it's like this 80-year-old lady that grows roses in a vegetable garden, and you say, well, ma'am, how long have you lived here? She said, I was born right over there. That I don't care how smart you think you are. That woman knows more shit. She's forgot more than you know. Talk to her. Talk to the oldest farmer you can find in your area. Find out what they grow commercially. That'll probably do well locally. Tie into that older wisdom. Uh, Darby on MeWe and Jameson on Float both said, raise meat and eggs and barter for your veggies instead of growing your garden. I don't know if that's a gardening hack, but it certainly works. And you'll find that, that a lot of times there's people that garden that live close to you that either don't want to or can't keep livestock, but they sure like a dozen eggs once a month or twice a month or what have you. And if you have plenty of livestock, it's real easy to barter for. If you raise meat animals, uh, you might be surprised at how much produce would come back for a meat rabbit or a meat duck or something like that. Next up, build a vortex tea brewer, says Scrambling. That's Brian Norton from Food Forest Farms. He says you can build a 50-gallon vortex compost tea brewer for about 100 bucks. I'm not going to go deep into that except to tell you what you're doing. You're taking compost and other materials and you're spinning water and aerating water. And you're doing that for a day or two. And then you're taking that resulting compost tea and you're, you're, you're using it as a fertility aid in your garden. And because you're taking that action of spinning it and aerating it, um, it, it has a lot more oomph. You get a bigger bang for your buck when you build your compost tea that way. I'll tell you, I built one. He said to do it with an airlift pump, which will work really great because you get a lot of oxygen that way. All I did was just take the one of the cheapest like fountain pumps you can get, like a little you know submersible pump. I took a piece of half inch pipe that came up off it. It went to a T. That T went out like a T to the to the rims of a thirty two gallon trash can, and then on both sides of that. There was one more elbow and one point in one way and one point in the other create a spiral. And then when you fill it up with your compost tea, you go a little bit below that. So when the water comes out of that pipe, it's not just pushing the vortex. OK, it's also aerating because it's got drop to it. And I took a cheap bulkhead and put it in the bottom of the, of the garbage can and screwed a hose bib into it. And I set the garbage can up on two cinder blocks. And you fill up, you know, three quarters of the way up with fluid. You put your compostable materials in it and you turn it on. You run it for a day. And then when you want it out, you just open your hose bib and it goes right into a bucket and you can put it directly on your plants. Works really, really good. Uh, next up, 
I had to look up what a dance tully was. It is, it's like really fine mesh for like costumes, like girly, frilly dance costumes. Kind of figured that what it was, but I wasn't sure. But that dance tully uh, is pest netting. And that came from Reset Remedy on Float. And that's very fine I, when I looked at it, and it's cheap. So if you have certain plants like squash, when you're trying to prevent the squash fine borers from over hammering your squash, you can make pest netting out of a dance toy. Diluted urine is a fertilizer from Dr. Steve on float. We've talked about that a lot. Basically, you dilute urine at about um, a, a, about like a 10% or, or less ratio of urine to water. So, you know, a cup to a couple gallons, basically. And you don't have to get real scientific with this. You can basically pee in a five-gallon bucket a couple of times and fill the five-gallon bucket up and water your plants with it. It's a very high nitrogen fertilizer, and it harvests that waste stream. It's not what I do, though. Um, I don't like to handle liquid urine. Really prefer not to. I take one of my old concrete mixing tubs, and I put it out over by my garden where I'm shading the trees, and I can do my business outside, and I'm not going to offend small children or women. Right, I'm kind of sequestered a little bit. And I take a five gallon bucket full of wood chips and I set it right next to it. I got to pee and I'm out on the on the farm. I go there and I pee. I take a handful of wood chips and throw it where I just peed. And when that when that tub is full, I take that tub, I set it aside, I stick another tub there. By the time the second tub is full, the first tub is completely broken down. It's some of the best compost, beautiful looking, no smell, high nitrogen compost you will ever find. And it is zero work. Uh, chicken tunnels around garden perimeters from Restiva on float. Basically, you build a way for your chickens to circumnavigate your garden but not get into your garden. Uh, maybe you attach that to your coop or when you bring your chicken tractor over, you attach your chicken tractor to it. And then basically you have a chicken moat protecting your garden. I think that's awesome too. Um, now, if you have questions for me that have anything to do with what we're talking about today, now would be the time to drop them in. The ones that I have marked, I'm about to go through. But from this point forward, if you don't hear me answer your question, well, then you need to reapply for your question to be answered. And Wade is asking about Bitcoin lending collateral loans. When will they happen? There are already ways to do that, but that does not have anything to do with gardening hacks. So we're going to stick on topic today. Uh, so here we go through these questions. I haven't time, had time to look at them. I'll be reading them in real time. So if there's something that doesn't quite work, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll modify as we go. Thomas says, and you don't have to ask about the hacks. You can ask about anything gardening right now if you want to. Thomas says, isn't the presence of pests evidence that the plants are not at full health? Can you expound? No. No. Um, plants that are heavily affected by pests can be nutrient deficient, and that's one reason the pests come after them. But if you don't think you could have a fully nutrient-rich, happy lettuce plant and no insect pest will eat it, that's, that's Kool-Aid propaganda. That's Kool-Aid level propaganda. The plant is more likely to survive an attack by the pest if it's healthy. The plant is more likely to fend it off. If the pest has a choice between a plant that's not doing so well and a plant that's in really great shape, it's more likely to go after the other plant. One of the reasons for that is the plant, the pests that eat these plants, when it comes to chewing, chew, this is chewing pests. This is not sucking pests. There's different kinds of pests. If you have a pest that's a chewer, they generally don't like fully hydrated plants. They're looking for cellulose. So when they the little insect mouth part starts chewing on a plant, and it's very, very hydrated with some exceptions, that, that pest is less likely to feed heavily on it. It wants a drier leaf structure. But you know what? Tomato hornworms, your tomatoes are fully hydrated. They'll eat the crap out of it, right? So we need to have something like a predatory wasp, a trypezoid wasp, is what corrects that or mechanical physical control. But again, a healthy tomato plant is going to be more likely to survive an onslaught by a pest. Is the plant fully grown? That's another side of it. See, what we're talking about here is a lot like when we talk about diseases in humans and people that talk about germ theory and terrain theory. And there's people that believe that the sole cause of illness is germs, germ theorists. And then there's people that believe that the germs have no effect on healthy populations. Those are terrain theorists. And the terrain theorists will use a fish tank as a way to explain this. 
And they'll say that a germ theorist, if you have an infection in a fish tank, medicates the fish tank. And a terrain theorist who's smarter and better and better than everybody else, right, will clean the fish tank and then the problem will go away. Having actually kept fish tanks, I can tell you that neither one of those work by itself. What works when you have an infection in a fish tank is you clean the tank, you do a water change, you fix the environment because there is a problem. You also medicate the fish appropriately depending on what's going on. Sometimes that is a direct medication like an antibiotic. Sometimes that's something like increasing salinity to knock down something like ick, right? And we should examine ourselves, our gardens, our livestock, everything with that. If we have pest pressure to the point where the plant is really encumbered, we probably have some sort of deficiency, okay? Some sort of health deficiency, soil health deficiency, most likely. But just because there's plant, there, there's pests on the plant doesn't mean that the plant's unhealthy. I promise you the healthiest plant in the world will be eaten by pest insects. In fact, if you go to countries where people think a little bit more than us, like Japan, and you go to a farmer's market in Japan, you'll actually find people that shop those markets and they look for plants that have a little bit of pest uh, damage on them because they know full well that plant was never sprayed with a pesticide. Because just because the guy selling to you says it wasn't, doesn't mean that it wasn't done. But if you see a couple little holes in there, that's not going to hurt you. And that plant was good, strong, and healthy. It survived. And it was something that the pest was willing to feed upon. So don't, don't really buy into that uh, like as a puritism. Like I, I have found in general, when you get purist in anything, you get a completely lopsided explanation and there's no logic or reason that can change their minds. Uh, Mayhem says, hey, Jack, um, Thanks for the help on the nutrient temperature question. You're welcome. Uh, next, I have Jack for cheap compost. Go to the city of Denton. You know, that's actually a really good suggestion. There are a lot of municipalities now that do compost. I'm just going to say you have purists like my buddy Paul Wheaton, and I really like him and I really respect him. But any kind of compost like that has to be full of herbicides and everything's going to die and you're going to kill everything if you use it. I've used that type of, of, of uh, compost. No, that's not the case. Um, however, you also get peers to say it doesn't matter. It'll be fine. No, that's not the case. Maybe your facility doesn't do a good job making compost. Maybe they do have some toxic ick in there, what have you. All you got to do to test compost from an unknown source, grow some beans in a pot. Okay. Take your compost, make compost tea out of your compost. Let your beans get up to where they have at least four or five true leaves on them. Water your beans in that pot for a week. If your beans don't get sick, you don't have a problem in your compost. Legumes are one of the most sensitive plants to any sort of herbicidal residue in a compost. You can do this to test straw as well. If you have straw and you're not sure of the source yet, soak your straw, water beans in a pot. If you have an herbicidal problem, the beans will tell you. Um, just be careful when you do it, but don't necessarily not do it. Thomas says, what about biochar or wood vinegar? I know nothing of wood vinegar. I love biochar. Uh, I have a pretty cool little kiln. person that, that sells it was on the show quite a while ago. It works great. You fill it up with a bunch of scrap wood. You set it on fire. You let it burn to a certain point. It kind of burns itself out, smolders. Once it gets to a certain point, you extinguish it, and then you harvest the charcoal. It works excellent. The thing about biochar, if you don't kind of nutrient charge it, it actually is a nutrient sink for a time, and then it becomes a nutrient delivery system. Best thing to charge your biochar with? Urine. Absolutely, urine. So go to your diluted urine in your bucket, but dilute at about a one-to-one -one ratio in this point, and dampen your biochar. Let it dry, dampen. You don't want to soak it. You don't want to drench it. Just kind of wet it, let it dry. Do that two or three times, and then apply it to your garden. Um, Ron says, Jack, what's your all time favorite plant to grow? Jalapeno peppers. Um, I thought it was going to be hard to give you an answer, but I absolutely love jalapeno peppers. Um, I grow them to the point that like my, my buddy, uh, David refers to me as the pepper whisperer. I've never failed to be able to grow jalapenos successfully ever um 
and we use them in so many ways. So peppers in general, but specifically jalapenos. If I had to pick another plant, probably Trombuccino zucchini, just because they're so impressive to have these giant squash, like three foot long, four inch diameter neck, pure squash meat all the way down to the bulb. Um, we don't eat a ton of it, but you know, we, we grow a few big ones every year. I think the biggest one I ever grew was 27 pounds. Um, and they're just really hardy and they, they fend off squash vine borers really, really well. Um, next, I'm going to just start going through here. And again, all caps, guys, is a better way to make sure uh, that I, I pay attention to what you're doing. But some different suggestions here by other people in the live feed. Use plastic, cheap plastic shower curtain liners with zip ties to create an inexpensive greenhouse effect on your indoor shelf systems. Travis, that's fucking brilliant. Just to be honest with you, I know exactly. You're, they're kind of heavy duty too. Your heavy duty clear shower curtain. That is a great like temporary in. I mean, I wouldn't try to build like a, a cattle panel greenhouse or anything, but even like an outdoor cloche system, uh, those things are very inexpensive and they're definitely tougher than like painter plastic or something like that. Good one, dude. Um, Next up, Hydrotain is a garden hack to save water, especially in summer months. Have you used it? Don't know what it is. Hydrotain. Hydrotain. Huh. Do you mean Hydrotain as in Lika? I, I can see that working, Wade, if that's what you mean. Um, if you're talking about Hydrotain as in the little marbles of clay that we use in aquaponics and hydroponic systems, I can see how mixing that into the top level of soil would improve moisture retention. I don't think it would work as good as uh, expanded shell, though. And expanded shell is a lot cheaper. I can get a yard of expanded shell down the road for 80 bucks. So that's about like half the bed of a pickup truck for $80. A If you're talking about hydrogen, which is what I think you're talking about, unless there's a brand name or something I'm not aware of, you know, a, uh, a big bag of hydrogen is 60 bucks or something like that. And it takes several of those to fill like a 50 gallon um, uh, stock tank for like an ebb and flow bed or what have you. And uh, I think we're going to, we're going to wrap up there. We're at almost an hour and a half uh, today, folks. And uh, I'm going to do something a little bit different. When I do the audio podcast Monday through Thursday, I always have an item of the day uh, through my, my, uh, my reviews that you can find at tspaz.com, T-S-P-A-Z, tspaz.com. You go there, you find all the products I reviewed, as long as you start your shopping at T-SPAS, you help us out no matter what you buy, but you can always check out T-SPAS to find the item of the day. And what I want to show you guys right now is my item of the day today uh, and kind of what T-SPAS looks like because a lot of you guys that watch me only on YouTube have probably never seen this. My item of the day is the Spider Wire Wolf Tackle Bag. Yes, this has nothing to do with gardening today, but it's on sale. This is my all-time favorite tackle bag. I've been using this thing for six years. There's a couple things about it I really love. One is the capacity. Two is it is tough as nails. If I don't break a piece of gear, especially fishing gear, in six years, it's a tough piece of gear. But the other thing are the, uh, the, the, the line minders on it. It has on both sides a place where you can have up to four standard size spools of fishing line. And winding line on fishing poles is a pain in the butt. You try to get your wife to do it, hold a pencil and keep the tension with the thumb so it doesn't overrun. You don't want to lay on that side and do that. You want to roll it straight off over the top like a toilet paper roll belongs. These line minders, the, the diameter of the tube on, the, on, the, uh, on the, the strap there fits tightly so that the whole tube spins around the string. And it keeps perfect tension for winding your lines. I love that. And it holds a lot of gear. Now, the, the telescopic rods that are in my behind-the-truck seat uh, kit that I keep this bag for, they don't make those particular rods anymore. There's lots of options. I keep three full-size telescopic rods with reels on them ready to go in that bag and all the gear and equipment that I need. I have a video where I went through all this. This thing's on sale today. It's, and I've, I've had this thing running as long as I've been running T-SPAS. It has only been on sale twice in the entire time that I've been uh, that I've been doing T-SPAS. And so it's on sale again today. So that's that's twice it's been on sale. It's not a huge markdown, but if you want the best fishing bag you can get, 
Check us out at tspaz.com. Again, T-S-P-A-Z, tspaz.com. Uh, and again, as long as that you, you're, you're using tspaz.com and you shop online, no matter what you buy, you help us out. And I kind of wanted to show you guys that maybe you have never been to tspaz before. Uh, let me pull that back up real quick. Um, I have a tab on the website that says that or you can just go to tspaz.com. It'll drop you right in here. Uh, you can check out all of the deals of the day that are on Amazon and shop for anything at the first link. You can see the current item of the day and kind of our reviews in sequential order and most recent reviews. And then you can go down to our reviews by category. We have like audiovisual gear, air guns, airsoft. Everything I've reviewed has been categorized and it's in the categories are alphabetical. We have gardening. Uh, you know, you can go there and you can find all the stuff that I recommend for gardening. And it's all categorized. And again, if you see it on T-SPAS, uh, I use it. I bought it and I buy it again. And if there's any times, I think there's two items in the entire catalog. There's over 400 items in the catalog. Two that I was given as a return for the, uh, you know, as in return for doing the review. In both instances, I said, if this thing sucks, I'm going to say it sucks. Okay. And I'm going to tell people that it was given to me. And both of those right at the top says this item was provided for the review. The remainder of those items I found because I needed it for myself I selected it for myself, and I'm telling you, it's top-notch. And when I find a better item, I replace the old item, and I don't take it down. I put a big notice on the front that says, I no longer recommend this item, not because it sucks, but because I found a better one. Click here to see it. I've been doing this now for five years. I've sold tens of thousands of products. I've never had any major complaints about anything that I recommend because if it's crap, I don't recommend it. Or if it's a cheap item that kind of is going to wear out, I tell you, like, this is the purpose of this item. With that, I hope you enjoyed things today. I enjoyed talking to y'all. It's been Jack Spierko with another episode of the Survival Podcast.